Okay. So I entitle my remarks, The Costly Decision to Do Things Your Way, Not God's Way. Okay. Mm. All right. I just want to begin by asking a simple question. How many of you, by way of show of hands, want the fullness of what God has for you? The fullness of what God's had for you? By show of hands. Yes? Myself included. Amen. Right. Sometimes, in order to get to that place where God wants us to have the fullness that he has for us, we have to learn, adapt, experience some things that we probably don't really like to encounter. But the harsh lessons have a significance because they teach us how to be humble and they teach us the way that God wants us to do things. Now, growing up in a Jamaican family, there is plenty of things that I hear, um, plenty of things I've experienced, and um, a couple of the things that I've, I've picked up along the way is, I'm not sure if you heard this saying, one of them is laugh and cry live in the same house. Anyone heard that? It may be a Trini thing, but they say in Jamaica too. Right. Laugh and cry live in the same house. Now, why, 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 oh, why did they say laugh and cry live in the same house? But if you check it, kids are playing. They're all laughing. All of a sudden, something happens. Boom, and you hear crying. And you think, ah, that's why laugh and cry live in the same house. The other thing that I've learned is if you can't hear, you must feel. Now, I noticed... Most people are more familiar with that saying than they are with the Trini saying. I'm just putting it out there. Sorry, my, my wife is, is half Trini, so obviously I have to put that one out there. So, I heard, if you can't hear, you must feel. Now, I heard this so much. And I grew up in a family of boys. So, I've got an older brother and a younger brother. So, if you can imagine, I heard this on a daily <laughs> basis. If you can't hear, you must feel. So much so that it was actually beaten into us. If you can't hear, you must feel. <laughs> I heard that and experienced that. Okay, right. So, you all know what I'm talking about. Okay. So, I heard that a lot from my mum and my gran and everyone else that dared to beat it into me and my brothers. And sometimes we would actually... If one of us got told off, the other two would be at the back laughing. <laughs> so that, that's, what, that's, how, that's how it was. That's how it was when we were growing up. In fact, I still hear it today. My mum still says it today, but thankfully not to me <laughs> anymore. These two, they get it now. I asked Ethan the other day, as you heard him say, has Nana said that to you? And he said, yes, she says it all the time, Dad. She says it all the time. I said, all right, she's saying it to you. You're lucky you're not feeling it like how we felt it. Because <laughs> we got it beaten into us when we were kids. Mm. But anyway, let's say I do, I do laugh when I, when I hear it. I just smile because I know what's coming. So, I believe that Moses in the Bible had a similar experience. Moses, as we all know, was a great man of God. There's no denying that. And with God's help, he convinced a whole nation of slaves to flee from their master in Egypt, travel across a barren desert with children and animals, conquer the land that they intended to live in and begin a new life. Now, if you think about the life of Moses and think about what he had to encounter, could you imagine taking his place? Could you imagine taking his place with that burden of carrying the whole slaves out of Egypt? This is just, in this day and age, that would be a challenge and a half. I mean, it's hard enough trying to get the kids ready for school in the morning, let alone trying to take a whole nation of people out of, out of Egypt. So, the thing is, the Israelite people, they encountered and witnessed so many great miracles 
with Moses. But what did they do? All they did was grumble and complain. So if you turn with me to Exodus. We'll start off in Exodus chapter 14. So I'll just quickly read through some of this. And then the Lord said to this is from verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Haroth, between Migdol and the sea. There they are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites were wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army." And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about, uh, changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. Okay, so we'll skip down to verse 10. Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up and saw they were... Uh, there were the Egyptians marching after them. They, ter- they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So... <sighs> They've just witnessed a great miracle. They get to the other side, and then they start complaining. Hmm. Verse, let's jump down to 31. I'm skipping a bit because there's quite a bit in this passage, and I'll encourage you to to go away and reread it because it is actually interesting, of course. Right, so verse 31 of chapter uh, 14 says, And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians. The people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses the servant. So after they had witnessed the parting of the Red Sea, they've gone through the other side. They've seen how um, God has delivered them. They now begin to put their trust in the Lord. So we think they got the lesson. Oh, no. Right, we move over to chapter 15. So they just come out the other side. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, the horse and its rider. He is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. So they begin to worship and sing and give praise. And you can see right the way through chapter 15. Pharaoh and his chariots and his army are hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers, they are drowned in the Red Sea. So it's almost like they're singing and they're, they're goading their opponents. You know, they, they've just come out of the... They've just seen this miracle happen and everything is, is good. And especially in verse 3, it's like they're singing, you know, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. If we jump down to, to verse 8, it says here, by the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The deep waters congealed the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I'll pursue them and overtake them, and I will divide the spoils. So they, they, they're, they're praising and singing, and they're rejoicing in the goodness of God. And then we get down to verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. That is why the place was called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? So again, they revert back to type. They're not really getting this, that God is their blessing, God is their covering, God is their provider. And they cried out to Moses, and Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And there 
and there they were able to drink the water. But then, just a bit further down, um, there the Lord made a decree and a law for them. And there he tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God who heals you. So, God makes a decree with them. And you think, okay, God has spoken. We've got this. We should do this. So if anything else happens, we know what to do. But oh no. We move over again to the next miracle in Exodus 16. So the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. I could park there and spark past the Rick's interest, but I'll I'll resist and move on. (laughs) Which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Now, could you imagine the whole community grumbling against two people in the desert? This is just, this is crazy. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So the Lord says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people will go out each day and gather enough for that day. So this is obviously the the miracle of the manna and the quail. But the people are still not getting this message. They're still not understanding that God is their provider. And they still grumble and complain. A bit like, if you can't hear, you must feel. (laughs) Right. So if we skip down to verse, verse 20. So God gives them specific instructions on how to prepare what they bring in, how to gather the bread, the manna, and the quail. But did they get that lesson? No, they didn't. They did not get it at all. So we find out about the instructions. And in verse 20 says, However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning until it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. So not only has God given them instructions... Moses also gave them the same instructions that God gave him, and they still were disobedient, and they still didn't get the lesson. I wonder, how many times has God tested us and asked us to do something? Something that may be so small, and we think, Lord, is that you? We even question if it's him. We say, Lord, is that you? Did you actually say that? But... It says here, they didn't get the lesson. So, we move on to the next chapter. And this is obviously a continuing theme. Exodus 17. And we read on from, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveled from the place to place the Lord had commanded. They camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses now, like anybody, and I can understand, he will be getting quite annoyed with them and saying, why have you not learnt this lesson? And so he replies, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put your Lord, why do you put the Lord uh, to the test? But the people were thirsty for water and there they grumbled. So they're just grumbling. My gosh, can you imagine walking around with a tribe of people that was just moaning all the time? Wouldn't be any fun at all. That's all they did was just moan, moan, moan. And again, they come back to this, why did you bring us up out of Egypt and make us, and our children, so they're bringing the kids into it now, and the livestock, die first. So Moses does what he does, he cries out to the Lord, and then he says, Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. So the Lord answered to Moses, walk ahead of the people, take some of the elders with you, uh, Take some of the elders of Israel and take 
in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it so the people can drink. So, simple instructions. God told Moses to walk ahead of the people. Take some elders of Israel. Take your hand. Take in your hand a staff which you struck the Nile. Strike the rock at Horeb, and water will come out for the people to drink. So simple instructions. And as I said before, how many times has God given us as individuals simple instructions and we don't follow through with it? Myself included. Myself included. The thing is, God is merciful. And although he could have done a whole lot worse, he spared these people and he provided for them. But they quickly forgot who was the one that was providing for them. How much easier would that journey have been if they just listened and done what they were supposed to do. They were in the desert for 40 years. 40 years. To do a journey that should have only taken maximum a week. So, these people grumbled at every turn. Now, let's skip over into Numbers. So we're going to jump to Numbers 11. If you just follow me there. There's still quite a, um, a few verses in between Exodus and Numbers where they still grumble and complain, but you guys get the point. So Numbers 11 and verse 4. Okay, we'll actually read it from the beginning. From verse 1. Now the people complained about their hardships, similar thing, in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Verse 2. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and fire died down, so that the place was called Taborah, because the fire of the Lord had burned against them. So, so much so that the grumbling and the complaining, God was getting really tired of their grumbling, and his anger burned against them. Then, we go on to verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. Whatever. <laughs> but now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. So they are now taking offense against God's provision. They're now reverting back to type, thinking about the life they had in Egypt. They forgot that they were in slavery. Totally and utterly forgot. All they're thinking about is the food they had and what, how much access they had to variety, if you want to call onions and garlic variety. <laughs> but that's what they're referring to. So, again, they, they moan. And then Moses, again, they, they grumble to Moses. Moses heard the people of every family wailing. That is serious. At each entrance to his tent, the Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, I love Moses' conversation with God, why have you brought this trouble on, on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you've put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? <laughs> Did I give them birth? <laughs> oh, gosh. Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers. Where can I get meat from for all these people? They keep wailing to me. So he's crying out to God saying, Lord, please, just take this away from me. Please, I can't take this anymore. And rightly so. Could you imagine you being in that position? Wow. <laughs> Amen. They keep wailing at to me, give, give me meat to eat, give me meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death, Lord, he's saying. Right now, if I find favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. So, the Lord being gracious says to him, bring, 70, bring me 70 of the, of the Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials, among the people, have them come to the tent of meeting, 
that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there and put, and I will take off the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will help you carry the burden. So although Moses is the chosen one, God is seen that Moses cannot cope and he's beginning to understand and he's willing to lighten the load. So verse 18 says, tell the people to consecrate yourselves in preparation. Then we move over to, okay, so we now get to, sorry, down to, yeah, so verse 16, you get, uh, yeah, we have, yeah. Yeah, so they consecrate themselves in preparation for tomorrow. When the Lord, where you will eat meat, the Lord will heard you, heard you wailed, if only you had meat to eat. So the Lord's, so, so the picture of the, the people moaning and God saying, right, okay, here's what we're going to do. Verse 20. Actually, yes, it's, it's, that's verse, sorry, verse 18, apologies. Second part of verse 18 says, Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. Verse 19 says, You will not eat it just for one day, or two days, five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. <laughs> so, the people were crying out for meat. They're getting their meat in abundance until it comes out of their nostrils. Now, again... What would our lives be like if God allowed us to have everything we wanted? He's trying to teach them a lesson here. They're not getting this lesson. So the lesson he's going to teach them is, if you can't hear, you must feel. So they're going to be eating meat until it comes out of their nostrils. But then we get down to... So, verse 24, Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He'd brought them together, 70 of their elders, and had them stand around the tent. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with them. And he put the spirit on the others that were there. I'm just speed reading. And then it talks about, in verse 26, however, two men, names Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. They were, they were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them. And they also prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, had been, had been Moses' aide since youth and spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people who were, all those people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So Moses is understanding that he wants this burden to be shared not, you know, with, with the elders. So he wants that to happen. And then it says, verse 31, Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It brought them down all around the camp to about three feet above the ground and as far as a day's walk in either direction. That's a lot of quail. <laughs> all that day and night, and the next day, people went out and gathered the quail. No one gathered less than 10 omers or homers. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, <laughs> and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. So again, be careful what you ask for. Therefore, the place was called Kibra. Hatavar, because they buried the people there that had craved other food. So a harsh lesson for these people. Very, very harsh lesson. <sighs> when are they going to learn? Okay, so we move over to Numbers 13. Now, Numbers 13. <laughs> Exploring Canaan. The Lord said to Moses, send some of the men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving the Israelites from each ancestral tribe. So, at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert, and he chooses 12 of the guys from, the, from his clan to go and inspect the land. Okay. 
So, it lists the names, and then we get down to verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev into the hill country, see what the land is like, and whether the people there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are the trees, are there trees there or not? And do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. So Moses picks the 12. He instructs them on what they have to do and sends them out. So they go out. And verse 23 says, When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. Now, it took two guys to carry a cluster of grapes. That's not your average grapes from Waitrose or Costco or, or, or Sainsbury's. That's a big, big cluster of grapes. And then, verse 25, at the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So they go back, and they give Moses the report. And then verse 27 says, They gave Moses this account. We went to the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. So they travel for 40 days with this fruit to men with the pole. There's no best before date with that, is there? <laughs> That's a big cluster of grapes, pomegranates and figs, and they carried it for 40 days, brought it back to Moses, and it was still intact. So, but what they did next... They then came back and said, But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of the Anak there. The Amalekites live there in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up there and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So here's a guy that's saying, Yes, I like the sound of that land. We can prosper there. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But then the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people because they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. A bad report. So why did they spread this bad report? Because they were fearful. They saw the people, and in verse 33... Up the second half of it says, we seem like grasshoppers in our eyes, in our own eyes, and they look the same to them, and we look the same to them. So they were fearful of what was ahead of them, and if they were to take possession of this land, how could they do this? How many times have we been in our lives fearful of certain circumstances? God has given us a promise, or he's given us something, and for many of us here, especially in this house, we've had many prophetic words, some of which people have not actually been living in just yet. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, as we know in Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.7. So fear is something that will prevent you from growing, from stepping out and believing what God has for you. And that's not what God wants for you. He wants you to step out. His vision for you is big, 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 and he wants you to step out in it. But he doesn't want you to be fearful. I've had, also myself, Karen and I have had prophetic words spoken over us in this house. And it, I was just reflecting on as, as when I first came here and the words that were spoken, if I, I was taking account of where, where God has brought me from to where, he's, where I am today. And if I stopped and was fearful of it, I would not have pursued any of it or have the, the faith to pursue any of it. Um, a few years ago, uh, after being a youth leader for so many years, I decided in my own way that I was, I was going to call time on it. And, and I did. And I met with Pastor Rick and explained my reasons. And um, Pastor Rick was gracious enough. He did allow me to step down. 
allow me after battling, but we got there in the end. And um, I said, right, Lord, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, just receive from you. I'm just going to go and just receive from you. So anyway, we went to holiday, went on holiday to Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I thought, right, okay, I'm just going to take these couple of weeks I've been working on, I need to get some rest and just R&R &R and just relax. Enjoy the family, da, 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 da. So Sunday comes and there's a church. We stayed in a, a town in Trinidad called Chagornas and there's a church around the corner from where um, mother-in-law lives. So we decided to go. And this church is probably about half the size of this building, if not smaller. Small congregation. Um, and we walk in there on a Sunday morning, and they're, they're worshipping, and they are worshipping. Trinis, I have to admit, know how to worship. They can worship. Anyway, so we're in the building, and I'm just sitting down there, and we're just, just getting involved in the worship. And after about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, so the worship team are up there, they're playing, and then the pastor comes out. And then the pastor comes, and he's, um, he's getting involved in worship, and then he, he starts to mediate the service, and then, um, then he gets ready to preach. So everyone's all seated. And it didn't take much to look around and knew that we weren't from the area. We were just sat there in the congregation, just trying to be humble and just trying to fit in as much as you can. And um, anyway, he starts to preach. And then midway through his preaching, he, he, he gets up and he, he comes off the platform and he walks over. And I can see him walking towards me. I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> what have I done? What have I done? And he walks up to, to where we are and he says, You, sir, young man, you stand up. So I look around thinking, he's, he's, just, he's talking to me? And he goes, yes, get up, get up, get up. So I stood up. And he said to me, You have been called by God to be a youth leader. And my jaw just dropped. And I just said, Lord. And he said, you may have thought that your time doing this has finished, but I'm here to tell you, God says it isn't. And then he just turned around and got back up on the platform and started to preach. And I'm like, and I'm like, like, like imagine Karen, I'm just like, wow. So here I am, leaving London, go all the way to Trinidad in a small, small church. And this man, doesn't know me from a can of paint, stops his sermon, identifies me, and gives me a word from the Lord. Now, you can run. <laughs> you can certainly try and run. But you certainly can't hide from God. And if he's got a plan for your life, he will use people. He will use circumstances to get his point across. It's kind of like sat-nav. Sat-nav is a great tool, yeah? You put your route in, it takes you from A to B. However, if you divert from that, the sat-nav, in its wisdom, will try and guide you back to where you're supposed to be going or your, your, your set destination. And it's just like God. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for your life. And no matter how much we try and divert and go off, he will just keep bringing you back to where you're supposed to be. And it's up to us at the end of the day. We have to make that decision. God, you've called me. You've equipped me. And if he's called you, he certainly has equipped you. You may not see it now, but as you continue in him to do the things that he's called you to do, you will see that he'll equip you. He'll put things and align certain things and give you the tools required to do what he's called you to do. It could take you a week, or it could take you 40 years, like the people that were in the desert. You guys need to realize that he's, his plan and his way of doing things is the best way. Sometimes we might think, oh, you know what? Especially, I, I thought this as a young person. Lord, I grew up in church. I'll serve you when I'm older. I'll serve you when, when I've done what I needed to do, and then I'll come back and serve you. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Serve the Lord whilst you're young. You young people, serve the Lord whilst you're young. Because he will use what he's got for you. And then by the time you get to our age, us older folk, 
you know it's set in stone, you're not going to divert from it. I cannot encourage you guys enough about sticking to the purpose and the plan that God has, and has for you. And we know the sad end to Moses because he didn't enter the promised land through disobedience. I don't want any of that to happen for any, anybody. God is awesome. He's powerful. He, he's, he's a provider. And even though the people didn't get the lesson, he still provided for them throughout all of it. They went through the desert 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out. Shoes didn't wear out. They had food. He will still provide for you. But do you take the short road or do you take the long way? Entirely up to you. There's two things I just want to just say before I um, wrap this up. Some of us in this house and some of you here have had words spoken over you. And you're thinking, you know what? I can't see that happening for me. Yes, it would be great if it could happen. But I can't see it. That's just the point. You don't see it. It's what God has in store for you. So if you've had a word spoken over you in this house that hasn't come to fruition yet, I'd just like you to stand up. God's spoken a word over your life. You've had a prophetic word from either a previous minister or a prophetic word that's happened in this house, and it hasn't come to fruition. Just stand. God has a plan, and his plan is not the way we see things. And I just want to pray with those of you that are standing. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all those that are standing right now. Thank you, Lord, that this word that's spoken into their lives, it's not dead. It's not dead. Thank you, Lord. The, the seed has been planted and it's been watered and nurtured, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that in time, those words will come to pass. I thank you, Lord, that in the time that we wait, we don't lose hope. We don't lose hope. Thank you, Lord, that everything works out in your time. In your time. And Lord, I just pray for every person that's standing right now, that Lord, that they, not be, that they will not become discouraged or disheartened to say, Lord, I can see this one being blessed or that one being blessed or that hasn't happened for me. I thank you, Lord, that in your time, things will come to pass. The word is not, the seed is not stolen. It, it will bear fruit. It will bear fruit. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.